So John read, uh, the, I guess, the first, uh, what did you read, the first paragraph there, about six or seven verses, eight verses. Um, so, we had talked... Um, we had talked last week about the at the at the end of chapter eleven how uh, the the Pharisees had gotten upset, the Sadducees were um, coming into play, the the priest in terms of getting upset about what Jesus was doing and with the resurrection of Lazarus, and here in the, these first verses of John chapter twelve we find that there is a uh, a, a celebration, a party, or a meal. Uh, taking place, and don't know for sure, um, you know, who who exactly was hosting it, but what we do know that Mary and Martha and Lazarus and Jesus were there. And why do you think... Well, what do you think that Mary and Martha and Lazarus thought coming out of the end of chapter 11. What do you think was going through their mind? Yeah. <laughs> they, w- obviously, they, w- they would have been happy because Lazarus was, was, was brought back to life. But, but do you think that their thinking might have went beyond that? Okay. Okay. All right. So they wanted a more um, intimate setting and a time to 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 uh, rejoice and fellowship and and be with him when they weren't under all that stress, if you will. Do you, if you remember the, the discussion we had, at particularly focusing on Jesus' conversation with Martha, and do you remember how M- Martha said, well, if only you had been here. And Jesus said to her, you know, there's more to the story than that, Martha. Lazarus is going to be okay. And Martha said, yeah, I know. He's going to be resurrected at the, at the end of at the end of all things and Jesus said to her says you know Martha I mean something more than that I'm telling you I am the resurrection and the life and and then he said do you believe this and Martha said gave that great confession where she said Lord I do believe and she testified to the fact that he was the Messiah and said I do believe that you're the Messiah and then when we get to, we, we ran out of time, but when we get to, to the tomb where, where Jesus is going to, getting ready to raise Lazarus from the dead, even at that point, Martha still does not believe that Jesus is going to do the very thing that she might have wanted, she might have liked, but she couldn't conceive of it because she said, Jesus, he, he's been in the tomb for four days. You don't want me to move that rock away. It's going to stink. And then Jesus tells her, Martha, do you remember, you know, I ask you if you believe. And so they rolled the stone away. He raises Lazarus. Lazarus comes forth from the grave. Now we get six days later, and they're having having a party, a celebration, if you will. They're all eating a meal together. Do you think at that point that Martha might have begun to advance her thinking? Well, well, let let, let me start with the obvious. At that point, Martha clearly, at that point, believed that Jesus could raise somebody from the dead who, by the Jewish notion, was truly dead. I mean, it had been four days. You remember we talked about that the Jews had a notion if it was less than four days, three days, eh, that they wouldn't have been as impressed by that as we are. But four days, they would have been very impressed. So she clearly knew that now that he could raise somebody from the dead that they all thought was dead. But do you think that her thinking might have advanced beyond that? Let's move on to Mary. Do you think that Mary's thinking... Now Mary seemed to have be a little more advanced in her 
thoughts about Jesus. What, what do you think Mary was thinking? What was causing Mary to do what she did in the verses that John just read for us? Okay, she, she, was, she was thankful. She had gratitude for bringing him back. Okay. They they were they were maybe or or beginning maybe beginning to catch a glimpse of what that what that what what a, a concept of glory the way that John was thinking about it that maybe Jesus had something else in mind. Have you ever been in a situation to where you you really you you wanted to do something for someone, and particularly if it was an expression of gratitude, but if you wanted to do something for someone, but you just, you had no, you didn't have the faintest idea of how or what you could possibly do that could ever rise to the level of your appreciation. In other words, I thank you this much, but all I know we're incapable of doing is this. Have you ever felt that way? I, I suspect we probably all have. I, I think that Mary was kind of in that position because what she did was a task that would normally have been relegated to, uh, to, to a slave or to a, the lowest servant in terms of washing their feet. That was a, you know, a custom that you'd typically offer some water because they went barefoot or had sandals on and their feet needed to be washed. And so they would typically, that would be the work of a slave or a servant um, if that was offered to a, to a guest that came into the house. But here, Mary does that herself, and she certainly wasn't a servant or a slave whether it was her house or someone else's, that wasn't her role, and yet she did that. But then she doesn't just wash the feet with some water. She takes this very expensive, um, probably was more like an oil, if you want to think about it, of, of uh, nard, and it probably was undiluted. Lots of times they would cut or dilute um, their, their what they called perfume, not the way we think about perfume, but of, of something that was a, had a good smell, sweet smell to it. They would have cut that because it was so expensive. They'd want to make it you know, stretch longer, uh, last longer, and they would have cut that. And she probably was just using the, the pure, straight stuff. And so she's putting this oil on Jesus' feet to wash his feet with that and, and then uh, proceeds to, to dry, dry it with her hair. I, I, that's kind of curious. I'm not sure uh, why other than maybe that's all that she had available or maybe she wanted to, that was her way of, of sort of personally investing herself in it. In other words, I'm, I'm doing everything I can for this to be about my gift to you. But the picture I'm trying to paint is that it seems like Mary was trying to find the best way that she knew how to express her love, devotion, and commitment to Jesus in, within their culture, within their custom, and she wanted to do that for him. And, and so we get the contrast here between Mary's actions and then we see one of Jesus' disciples, what's his reaction? Uh, disbelief, and he he is, and he's, and he's in fact saying, "Why did you, why did you not sell this and give the money to the poor?" And then John expands on that a little bit and says, "Well, not sure that that really was his interest. His interest was probably he wanted the money for himself, since he sort of kept track of things." Now, the curious thing is, is who did the who did this oil belong to? I'm sorry. Yeah, who knows, but it, but it, 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 it wasn't Judas's, right? <laughs> I mean, we, we know it wasn't the disciples, and yet Judas is saying, well, this should have been sold and given to the poor. So it's kind of curious that he was sort of jumping in on somebody else's 
item and how they used it and what they used it for. And the fact that, that she used it for Jesus, it was curious that he jumped in on that because he was a disciple of Jesus. Now, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, and so there's just him saying it, it, it was intended for my burial. That makes me think, you know, who was preparing it, or you know, what did Jesus mean to do on something that they didn't prepare? But I think, you know, as Jesus goes on to say, in, in a very humble way. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it, whether Jesus was suggesting, well, well <laughs> Jesus knew what was going to happen, um, but whether he was intending that to be just purely a foreshadowing of that, like, um, hey, she could have kept this for my burial, or whether she did hold back some of it for that, and he was just sort of letting some of the story out of the bag, or whether, whether this was sort of symbolic, because, you know, Jesus said, um, you know, he, 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 when, when he moved forward after, uh, after uh, the raising of Lazarus, when Caiaphas says, you know, hey, has this great idea, said better that one person die rather than, than all of us die, and it's, the scripture says that he, was prophesying that, that God basically put those words, if you will, into his mouth uh, because of what was about to come. And this is the turning point where he said we're leading fast, leading into uh, Jesus' crucifixion. And so it could be that Jesus also meant that in the sense that, you know, he's going to say here very shortly at this, this, just after this gathering that my hour has come. So it could be that Mary, uh, what she is doing is, if you will, is symbolically doing something in her worship that is going to be reflective of the fact uh, that Jesus knows this is what's coming and I want to let you know this is what's coming. Yeah, yeah, Mary, you know, Mary, Mary is focused on, on worship, is locked in on, on, um, on Jesus. And I, and I think the, 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 the thing that's um, pro probably the takeaway from this, and then I want us to move on to the next section, is um, think about the contrast here specifically between um, the, the, the actions of Mary and the actions of Judas. And the contrast is that one is giving what they have and that is probably um, a significant part of what they have or what they have access to and giving that to be used in worship to Jesus and praising Him. And the other one is complaining as to why that isn't being used for another purpose when we know underlying that, John tells us through the Spirit, that the, the underlying purpose is Judas wanted that for his own motives. And just think about that. I think it's fair to make that application to us today. You know, do I choose to take that which I have access to or that which I have and devote that and use that in worship and praise to God? Or am I always clamoring for what the other person has because I want more? You see, one is I'm going to take what I have and give it away. The other one is I want what you have so that I can use it for me. Do you, you see the, the stark contrast that's presented there? And, and I believe that 
part of the reason John puts this in the story is so that we can have that takeaway is those are the reactions that people have to Jesus both today as well as 2,000 years ago. Uh, verse 12. Um, well, well, let's drop back to uh, verse 9 real, and, and read it, pick up there. Meanwhile, a large crowd of the Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well, <clears throat> for on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. You know, some, sometimes I, I think we get in the, in the Gospels, as we read through these stories in the Gospels, we can get lost in the fact that um, it, it was not always everybody's following Jesus or nobody's following Jesus. God was at work through all of it. And we see here that people were coming to believe in Jesus and want to follow him. Not, not only literally follow him, but I mean wanted to devote their lives to him. And John tells us that that was happening because of the fact that Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. Well, that's the point. That's, that is the point of the miracles testified to the fact that he was the Messiah. And the raising of Lazarus, I, I, I said last week, that I believe that that is sort of the penultimate event, in other words, the second most significant event in the book of John, because, one, it was the one time when Jesus demonstrated to, to the Jewish mind, to the Roman mind, to everybody's mind, that he had the power over death and truly had the power to give life. And secondly, because it was a week or so, ten days before his resurrection, he was testifying to the world of what was going to come. I believe that was the reason for the timing of that event. As he said, I am the resurrection of life. He wanted people to get a double whammy. They see Lazarus resurrected and they're thinking, wow, that's amazing. Then they see Jesus die and they think, oh, you know, the emotions swing to the other end. And it's like, oh, he's, he's dead. The, you know, the great one is gone. What are we going to do? And then he raises from the dead. And after that, Everything changed for those that were locked into him. Everything changed. And it's not in small part due to the fact not only that he had resurrected, but they remembered the fact that he had raised Lazarus. All that fell into place. And so here we see people who are believing in Jesus and following him. And so I think it's important to remember that at the same time there's people wanting to kill him and do away with him and wanting to kill Lazarus because they somehow think that that's going to solve the problem. But they, that's what they wanted to do. Others were coming to believe in Jesus. So, bringing that home to us. When we live in a world where we think, does anybody care? Does anybody have any uh, uh, regard for God? Does anybody have any regard for Jesus and the sacrifice of Jesus? Just remember that even back then when people were, were wanting and seeking and plotting to put Jesus to death, there were people who were still coming to believe in him. Okay? Don't think, I think that can get lost in, in, in the mix of the big narrative. We can lose sight of that. But I think that's an encouraging and helpful thing. Verse 12, uh, the next day the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey, donkey and sat upon it. As it's written, do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming seated on a colt. At first his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Now, I can't, t do you, well, do you know what today is? I can't tell you how much work John and I had to put into to making sure that we could talk about John chapter 12 on Palm Sunday. But, no, it really, I was thinking about that this week and I thought, wow, that's really strange how that worked out. Um, so, Jesus is coming in to, uh, to Jerusalem, and the crowd is gathering, and they're waving palm branches, and they're <clears throat> calling out to him um, and quoting passages from the Old Testament Scripture that testify to him. 
Um, it's interesting from, from, from the reading that I've done, um, the, the term Hosanna here, <clears throat> that term, uh, from, from, the, from what I have, my reading and study, that term really, uh, it, it, it's kind of curious the way that John presents it here. And probably that term had become to be one of the, a, a term like that we may use in some instances where there's not, um, like, like we may say, you know, somebody gets excited about something or if you're writing and you say, hooray, you know, that would be kind of like Hosanna. It's almost like a cry, a, a term that you couldn't really define very well, but when you hear it, you know what it means. Does that make sense? You know, if I ask you to define hooray, you'd sit there and probably take 10 sentences to tell me what it means. But at the same time, if I hear somebody say hooray, I kind of know they're excited about something, they're happy about it. Well, that's kind of the way this term hosanna seems to have come to be used, that it was not in its original context, it would have been kind of strange for them to have said it here because it was more like a cry, you know, hey, save us, help us. It would have been in the original meaning of it, but that would be an odd context here because you'd have to presuppose that everybody that's here waving the palm branches thinks that Jesus is going to go into Jerusalem and be crucified. And I would contend from the context and everything else we know, that wasn't at all what, what they had in mind. Now, they may have thought he was going to go into Jerusalem and do something great, but they had no idea that he was going to go into Jerusalem and what was going to happen was going to happen. Um, it, yes, in the, in, the, in the Hebrew, I believe, I believe it comes from a Hebrew root, and I think it means save us. It could be. I, I just, from, from, from the, the authors that I read suggested, and, and it seemed to me that the, the emotion of the word was more as you're suggesting it, but the context is one that I don't know that these people think he's being led to the slaughter. I think they know there's people opposed to him, but I don't think that they necessarily know that it's all going to fall apart. But, but it could be. But in the... Could be, could be, and and certainly that's true. What what that that there's no doubt that he was and is <laughs> their hope and our hope. There's no question about that. Now, what what do you make of the the dis, or or did you catch there in verse uh, sixteen? The disciples uh, did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. This is getting back a little bit to uh, what I, the conversation that I was having with uh, Chet. Do, do you, the, you know, John, John says the disciples didn't, didn't realize didn't understand these things until after he was glorified. Now, when John uses that term glorify, we've said time and again that John doesn't use that term the way that we commonly think about it or the way that it's used in some cases in Scripture. This wasn't like a big, shiny, spectacular moment, glorify. This was the, the act of service, and specifically, John typically referred to Jesus' glorification as his death on the cross. And that's how, when, he, when John says he's going to be glorified, and Jesus intimates that from his own words, he says, it, you know, I'm going to be glorified. It is when he was going to be crucified. And so the disciples didn't know 
for sure what Jesus was talking about. They didn't realize it. And, and then it says that they didn't realize that these things were, <clears throat> were about him or that they had done these things to him. Yeah, yeah. The, I, I, I think in, in plain, simple terms, that's, that's, that's correct. They, they didn't seem to understand it. Now, bring that home to us. <laughs> I, I, this thought hit me this past week. If, if we're being honest, are there ever times when I have read something, heard something, seen it in Scripture, once, twice, five times, ten times. And I still find myself in a position of opposition or out of alignment. I mean, in other words, am I, am I any different than that? We, we look at them because they, 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 God chose to put them in print. He didn't choose to put me in print. And so, you know, they have to live with it. But, but you know, if, if I'm honest about it, on a regular basis, I find myself doing the same silly thing. If, if my story were in print, it probably would be much worse. You know, it's like, what in the world? You know, we say, well, why didn't they understand? Why didn't they get it? Why didn't they do something different? Why didn't they change? And yet, and yet, I'm guilty of the same behavior, and I have information that they didn't have. Yeah, thank goodness. <laughs> that that is it is encouraging that we um you know that we have hope it give, gives me hope that i'm i'm not maybe as i i may be messed up but i'm not as weird as i may think that i am people included when i was going to talk about talking about people about jesus because i just can't quote right yeah just you, you know, there, there's lots of ways that we can testify. I think a few weeks ago, I think uh, uh, John talked about that on Sunday. You know, there's some people that are, that are good, capable. They're called to go somewhere and to proclaim the word in, in one form or a fashion in, in that way. And there's other people that are, do things that are, can be supportive of that or things that more, um, if you will, are passive that stem from the life that we live and the way we conduct ourselves. And, that's, and they're all necessary and they're all important and they all give glory to God. I think that's a great point. Uh, verse 17, Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Hmm. I, I don't want to... I, I don't want to... Um, I don't want to lay something on Scripture that may be unintended, but I think it is very interesting the way that John words that. They had seen Lazarus raised from the dead, and they continued to spread the word about that great phenomena that would attract people to Jesus. And it just makes me think, hmm, how is that any different than the word that we are called to spread when we know that the Messiah has risen from the dead and, and offers uh, the promise of life. I don't know that that's what John intended, but it sure makes me think uh, of that, that they were continuing to spread the word about the fact that Jesus is the resurrection and life. Many people, uh, because they had heard that he had, been, that he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is, uh, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. <clears throat> you know, all through, all through Scripture, from the very beginning of time, 
there has always been, always been, uh, or I'll say, I'll say from the time of Genesis chapter 3 onward, there has always been a battle between good and evil. There is always going to be people who are seeking God, who are finding God, who are clinging to God. And there has always been people who do not want to find God, who do not care about God, who reject God, and who want to tear people away from God. That has always, always been true. And we see that here. The same thing that caused some people to be attracted to Jesus caused somebody else to reject Jesus. That's not because of the nature of Jesus. That's because of the nature of the heart. Okay? Je Jesus is who he is. And either I am going to be attracted to him because I see that there is value, there's goodness, there's life in him. Or I am going to reject him because I find that something that, that runs counter to who I am and who I want to be. And that struggle goes on all the time. Uh, what, what time I, I, I was in such a dither this morning, I forgot my phone even, which I almost never do, 909. Okay, um, I want to look at see here. Uh, verse uh, 23. Uh, Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth. Unless a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now, my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. <clears throat> you know, I, I believe we said this last week. You know, it's a truism that there cannot be life without death. You know, in order for there to be the true life, the abundant life that we talked about, there has to be death. There has to be death to myself. And Jesus here talks about the grain of wheat. Says the grain. Now he's talking about his death, but he's also, I think by extension, making a point for us. He says, if the grain of wheat doesn't die, if it just is there, it's there by itself. Now you think about that. I'm either going to die to myself and live to Christ and be raised as a as a crop, as a, uh, a, a fruitful plant, God will transform me from simply a grain into a plant. Once I have died as a piece of, of, as a grain, I die and I grow into a magnificent, productive plant. Or I can stay there and be the seed, be the grain forevermore, but I am there alone. Did you notice how the scripture said that? It dies and it is alone. It is by itself. That is the choice that I'm making. I can choose life from the one who created life. John said in John chapter 1, he was there at the beginning. The one who created life, the one who gives life, the one who is the resurrection and life. I can choose him and invest myself in him and die to myself and have that life. Or I can choose to stay where I'm at, be who I am, what I want to be, but I will do that by myself. I will do that alone can choose life in God, can choose to be alone. Life in God or alone. And Jesus typifies that and says, I want to be glorified. Father, glorify me. Because Jesus knew he's now getting days away. Jesus knew his moment to be glorified the way that John talks about glory was his death. The world doesn't think about that as glorious. But we think about that as glorious because we know that not only did he die, but like the grain of wheat, he was resurrected into something that was oh so much more and would forevermore change humanity. That's why we're here today. If he wasn't resurrected from the dead, I don't know that there'd be much of a reason for us to be here. 
That's a great story. Appreciate your patience today. Sorry for being late. Thanks.